Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Nicholas Bloom. Nick is a professor of economics at Stanford University and is the co-director of the Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He also formerly worked at the United Kingdom's Treasury Department. Nick joins us today to talk about economic uncertainty and the productivity slowdown. Nick, welcome to the show. Hi there. Oh, glad to have you on. We have read your work, and we'd love to get into it in a moment. Um, before we do that, though, with all my guests, I'd like to ask them, how did you get into economics? <laughs> I, um, I, I don't really have the, the most direct story here. I uh, was actually intending to go work in investment banking or certainly make a lot of money. And I uh, did well as an undergrad. I got a first in Cambridge, which meant I was enabled to uh, get funding to do a master's in Oxford. And at the end of that, I actually applied to a bunch of investment banking jobs uh, consulting, even an IT help desk, which is like insane mm. when, I, <laughs> when I look back in it. And the interview that was by far and away the best was actually with the Institute for Fiscal Studies. So the IFS is a research think tank in London. It was run by uh, uh, Richard Blundell and Andrew Dillnock, and it's part of UCL. And it was just a fantastic interview. They talked about economics. It was fun. It was uh, super interesting. And in fact, back in that day, back in those days, that was 1996, the pay gap versus finance wasn't that big, whereas now it would be huge. But anyway, back then it wasn't a big pay cut. And I thought, great, I went to the RFS. And then once I was there, I started doing a PhD part-time at UCL advised by John Van Rienen and just kind of fell into economics. And from that point onwards, I just loved it and have stuck with it. Oh, very interesting. So you're now at Stanford University and you are pretty prolific. I was going through your work and preparing for the show. You have a lot of articles, a lot of research done. And one of the areas that you're well known for is this area of uncertainty, economic uncertainty. And you've created an uncertainty index, a policy uncertainty index. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but let's jump into this conversation about uncertainty. And let's first maybe define what is uncertainty. So how would you define it and how, how should we think about it in our conversation today? It's a great question, <laughs> There's actually, um, you know, there's two, there's two ways to think about it. One is the, the, layman, the layman's definition, or if you read the Wall Street Journal or The Economist, or mm -hmm. when I talk to people all the time, uncertainty is, you know, not, not knowing uh, the future. And so you might say, hey, look, if I flip a coin, I'm going to be uncertain about what happens. There's also a more formal economics definition, which is slightly different. So Frank Knight, the famous Chicago economist, um, actually defined uh, uncertainty is what we would think of might we might call as nineteen uncertainty. So he would say flipping a coin is risk. You have a known probability distribution. You have you know half fifty percent heads, fifty percent tails. Whereas uncertainty is something over which you really have no sense of the probability probability distribution at all. So an example might be you know the number of coins ever produced by mankind. I, I really have no idea how to assign a probability to that. So formally, that's uncertainty. Some people call that nighting in uncertainty. Others kind of call it ambiguity. Um, I'd, so, you know, it's a bit of a mess, but certainly uh, the broad concept is not knowing, you know, the future outcomes, whether you know the distribution or whether you're even uncertain about the distribution is a, a more uh, fine-tuned de definitional difference. Okay. But for our purposes of discussions today, uncertainty, it's kind of a mix of those two ideas. It's, it's a little more... Uh maybe a little more unclear. Is that right? Yes. You know, you know, economists like to uh, kind of pick hairs over these two concepts. But in practice, I think reality is somewhere in between. So okay. you may you may look at options markets and think, well, look, you know, the financial markets has options traded all the time, which means people are calculating uh, distributions about various states of the future and trading on it. So in that sense, you think, you know, everyone has a pretty good idea of the distribution of future outcomes. You may then say, well, let's think of something that is a period of nighty uncertainty. So I remember when I was starting my PhD, I was thinking a lot about, well, halfway through my PhD, anyway, 9-11. So 9-11, you know, the uh, planes hit the Twin Towers, um, markets closed down. You know, we have no idea what's going on. Initially, actually, Al-Qaeda took no responsibility for it. Nobody actually 
you know, claim the attacks for a while and there's massive confusion. So that you think was a period of pure night in uncertainty. We've, we've never seen anything like that before. We've no idea what might happen. But at the same time, while American financial markets were closed down, European options exchanges were still trading and that you could buy options on the S&P 500. Mm-hmm. So it tells you that even periods of seemingly immense night in uncertainty, there are still people prepared to put probabilities on events. So I think, you know, Sometimes I, I think most people actually put probabilities on most events. And so pure night in uncertainty is actually a pretty rare occurrence. Well, this has become a hot topic. I mean, obviously, the past decade, we had the Great Recession. Uh, you've done a lot of research on this. The Federal Reserve has talked about it. The IMF has talked about it, as you mentioned in your paper. Um, what got you into this, this area of uncertainty? Was it the 9-11 episode or was anything else that really prompted you along this path? <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I, I was the classic grad student. So mm-hmm. I uh, was burrowing away on a, uh, extending a paper. This was a 2006 paper in the Review of Economic Studies by Ross Cooper and John Halteranger, estimating adjustment costs. And it's a great paper, but it's, I mean, it's r- well cited. And I was trying to extend it from capital to capital and labor, which ultimately is not that interesting an extension. I was using some <laughs> mathematical tr- tricks to do it. And, you know, I, I was so excited by by this, um, and I, you know, start talking to anyone about adjustment costs, and I could see their eyelids starting to droop and you know, <laughs> like struggling to stay awake. Nice. And uh, at some point, I thought, you know, who cares? Like, ultimately, my extension is not going to change the world. But oddly enough, while I was fiddling around with uh, estimating labor and capital adjustment costs, at some point, I had this kind of eureka moment that. If uncertainty was time varying, suddenly these things mattered a lot. And I remember going to a conference that the MBR Summer Institute presenting his paper. And about a month before I presented, I managed to figure out and do some basic simulations on what happened if uncertainty changed over time. And suddenly figured out that, look, actually, it would be very powerful. Uh, I hadn't read Ben Bernanke's 83 paper, which was kind of doing very much the same thing. So I was operating, in a sense, in parallel, but later than him. But I realized that, you know, time variation uncertainty generates powerful effects. And then in that in that uh, presentation, Russ Cooper asked me, hey, but does uncertainty change over time? And again, I was just, you know, finishing up my PhD at the time. And I kind of thought, I, I don't know. I've, I've never looked. Uh, so that and, and then I was kind of like, great question. So from that point onwards, which is the uh, uh, kind of late 90s, I started to look at, hey, do, can we measure uncertainty and does it vary over time? And at that point, the best measure of uncertainty was implied volatility on the uh, S&P 500, what's called the VIX. So it's kind of a measure of how volatile stock markets will be over the next month. And when I looked at that index, it was incredible. It just every time there's a recession or a nasty event, uh, it spiked up. So going back to, for example, the assassination of JFK. So back then we didn't have the VIX. We just looked at, I just looked at realized stock market volatility. Stock markets surged and were bouncing all over the place. The Cuban Missile Crisis, OPEC-1, OPEC-2, Gulf War One. Basically, every time there's a nasty event, uncertainty surged upwards. And from that point onwards, I began to focus heavily on, hey, look, recessions and bad events seem to not only carry bad news, that's kind of the first moment, or negative TFP or demand shocks. They also seem to be associated with big spikes in uncertainty. And maybe it's the second that's causing some of the drops in activity. And fortunately for you... The Great Recession came along <laughs> and really spiked yeah. interest in this. Unfortunate for humanity, but fortunate for you, um, the Great Recession really gave this uh, research agenda a new lease on life. And you had a 2009 econometric article, I believe, that uh, looked at some of these issues and a subsequent spate of articles following that. But let's, let's go to some of these measures of uncertainty. You mentioned one already, um, one of the macro measures you, you list in your papers, uh, volatility of stocks. You mentioned that, the VIX. But there's some other ones. Tell us about bond markets, exchange rates, and GDP. Can those also be used to uh, get a sense of uncertainty? Yes, you know, there's a uh, there's a range of different measures, and you can break them up into kind of micro or macro, okay. and forward looking and realized. So if we start at the macro level, um, realized is things that actually see there's more volatility in a recession. So for example, you look at GDP growth rates. Mostly GDP is growing upwards by two, three percent a year, but suddenly when recessions happen, it plummets downwards. And so that generates, if you run Gartsch models, that generates a big spike in volatility. If you look at industrial production, it tends to bounce up and down much more in recessions. 
you look at exchange rates, they tend to bounce up and down much more in recessions, bond prices, stock market prices. So all of those uh, realized measures of volatility spike up in recessions. You can also look at forward-looking measures. Um, for example, implied volatility in the stock market, the VIX index, which has been called mm-hmm. the fear index, which um, is backed out from kind of put and call options. And it looks at expected stock vol, that goes up. You can look at forecast to disagreement. So if you are use things like the survey of professional forecasters from the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank, they poll about 50 forecasters um, each, I can't remember, is it each month or each quarter, but whatever it is, you see there's much more disagreement in recessions. So in normal periods, like now, it's kind of most people are predicting 2.5% growth next year. In 2008, 2009, there was wild disagreement. So those are um, macro measures. Another one I should say I've worked on recently is even newspapers. Um, I worked on something called the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, where we just do a, a you know automated scrape of newspapers of the number of articles that appear to mention the words economic or economy uh, uncertain or uncertainty in one of a few basic sets of policy words like Congress, regulation, or White House. And those index, those the frequency of those articles also surges massively in recession. And the, that that data is available online. Your uncertainty index, correct? Yes. The, the Economic and Policy Uncertainty Index is available online. We have a website called www.policyuncertainty.com. Yep. Um, you know, partly that, that, that website is just, you know, you're, you're, I, I should step back a minute. You're entirely right. I was, I was extremely lucky for my PhD research in the sense of the timing of the Great Recession. I, I unfortunately, <laughs> you know, I had not bought a house and had some, I'd worked in McKinsey for a bit. And so I had some savings mm-hmm. and for my pension in the stock market. And that plummeted. They're all in actually sterling. So I'd moved to the US, but all my savings were in the, U- the London Stock Exchange. And that fell even more because the pound crashed. So on the financial side, it was a disaster. But on the career, human <laughs> capital side, it was, uh, it was great because what happened was the Great Recession was uh, obviously a huge recession, but it was accompanied by an unprecedented run up in every measure of uncertainty. And Particularly after the Great Recession, 2009, 2010, I was asked a lot about policy uncertainty, the impact of TARP and you know, the pretty radical policies that were going on. And so I started working with Steve Davis and Scott Baker to try and measure it. And we started very small, uh, scraping a lot of newspaper articles because it seemed like really the only way to come up with a measure. And I had to say initially it was a very unambitious project. And as we you know, continued to work on it, we got more and more interest. And it was not high tech. It's super low tech. But it just appeared to kind of uh, pitch the zeitgeist in the sense of it's actually very hard to measure uncertainty. This isn't a perfect measure, but it seems to be, you know, not it, it was about as good as the other measures out there. So we put this thing out and we got a lot of pick up from financial sector from the Fed. Bloomberg carries the data now. So it's kind of in the last two, three years, it's really taken off. It's just another measure of uncertainty. And people are using it in their research, right? They're using it in their models um, and, and their statistical analysis, correct? Yes, it's been used a lot. So the, the basic issue is you want to measure uncertainty. You want to say you're the Fed or you know, a researcher or even a hedge fund. Mm-hmm. Um, so early on, a lot of the people actually were using it were um, hedge funds because they wanted to mm-hmm. measure the credit spread. So the difference in the interest rate on AAA versus say triple B bonds. So how much um, how much do you pay for the risk of uh, having holding a triple B bond? How much extra interest rate? And traditionally they'd use the VIX. So the VIX is a measure of implied volatility on the stock market. Historically it worked very well, but uh, post 2009, particularly 2010, the VIX and stock market volatility in general has been trending down and down. And in fact, about three weeks ago, um, so in early October 2017, the VIX hit an all time low of, you know, nine. Um, so stock markets are incredibly quiescent and therefore all the measures of uncertainty based on stock market indicators are incredibly low right now. But p- people don't think that uncertainty is low. I mean, we have, you know, Trump and Brexit and North Korea and all right. kinds of things going on. And our policy uncertainty index is actually moderately high. It's not really high, but it's certainly not low. And credit spreads are also about medium. So what's happened is a lot of hedge funds, I've heard, talked to them, have said they've been using policy uncertainty as another measure of um, Interesting. A kind of market, a market risk. And it's, 
been so I, I really don't want to claim it's a perfect measure. It's based on newspapers. Mm-hmm. It's only papers. There's all kinds of problems with it. Um, so well, we'll, know, get, it, we'll get to those in a minute. Some of the endogeneity issues. Um, but I'm just curious off the cuff. I'm sitting here listening to you. It strikes me that measure would be useful in trying to maybe explain some of the term premium movements on, say, ten-year Treasury yields. And central banks have been active in doing large-scale asset purchases, and they believe that they're having some effect on term premiums. But you have a global – I was looking on your webpage. You have a global um, policy uncertainty index, and I imagine something like that. It would be neat to see a study you know, kind of connecting that to the uh, term premiums on um, long-term Treasury bonds. Has anyone done anything like that? You are exactly <laughs> – Exactly right. So I'm scrabbling to remember who it oh, geez, I, the, Her name is blanking me, but I was at the IMF about mm-hmm. three weeks ago and somebody sent me a paper looking at, so, you know, an IMF paper looking at term premiums and in fact, uh, swaptions, uh, which is a kind of complicated measure of, it's basically the risk and the term premium. And that turns out to be incredibly correlated with our policy uncertainty index, as does in fact the longer end of the implied volatility curve. So, just to explain it in a bit, more, a bit more detail. So the VIX, the VIX index is an index put out by the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, which is they put out a number every day, which is the implied volatility on the next 30 days, the S&P 500 index. So when it's high, it means that the market thinks the index is going to be very volatile. When it's low, they think it's going to be pretty flat. And that thing is very low right now. But there's also a VIX uh, curve, uh, a vol curve, which is, goes from 30 days all the way out to 10 years. And I've got hold of that data from some contacts in Goldman Sachs. You can do it yourself. But looking at that data, it turns out policy uncertainty is much more correlated with the long end of the curve. So exactly as you say, a lot of the big policy uncertainty issues right now, for example, Trump's effect on free trade, on tax reform and social security, uh, you know, more generally on free market stability, the political system, war with North Korea, you know, the breakup of the European Union. Not, all of these issues are huge issues in the long run, but they're not very likely to be resolved 30 days from now. So you're precisely right. Long, long run focus measures of uncertainty, like the long end of the yield curve or the long end of the vol curve, are actually much more correlated with policy uncertainty than near term measures. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And it, and it ties into something I've looked at recently and I've been t- dabbling around with, and that is you know, the safe asset shortage problem. I'm getting a little ahead, ahead of myself here in our interview, but. And part of that discussion is if you look at long-term uh, government debt yields across the world and countries that we consider safe assets, safe harbors, such as Germany, the United States, United Kingdom, you know, their, their, their uh, long-term treasury yields have been going down persistently. Um, above and beyond that, it would have been implied from the, the QE programs. Um, and one of the stories is there's this, you know, there's this increased risk appetite Um um, excuse me, risk aversion, and people are clamoring for safe assets like treasuries. And this uncertainty index would be a great way to flesh out that story. And from what you're telling me, it does flesh it up very nicely. Yes, exa- exactly. As you know, I'm, uh, I'm an avid listener to your podcast, so I've heard you discuss this be- before. Um, yeah, very much. I think of the policy uncertainty index, it has no precise time horizon because it's effectively – how much uh, there seems to be discussion of policy uncertainty in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. You can imagine most newspaper articles aren't really, and the newspapers are looking at, you should have in mind, you know, the, they're the, the biggest 10 in the US. So the Wall Street Journal, but also the New York Times, the USA Today, Chicago Tribune, uh, Washington Post, etc. So they are highbrow, but they're not, you know, financial focused. And they are talking about mainstream policy issues like healthcare reform. And healthcare reform or social security reform is a, uh, is a big long run issue. Yep. The federal government is uh, is effectively, you know, bankrupt if we're looking twenty years out, and something has to be done. But we know that none of that's going to happen in the next thirty days. All right, there's some other measures, but let's let's move on for the sake of time because I want to get to your productivity slowdown discussion as well. Um, let's let's move to why uncertainty might be important. So you list two channels. I'm drawing from your Journal of Economic Perspectives paper in 2014. It's called Fluctuations and Uncertainty. We'll provide a link to that and some of his other articles on the SoundCloud webpage for the podcast. But in that article, you present two channels, two transmission mechanisms through which uncertainty could have you know, real effects on the economy. And I, and I, I take it independent and beyond and above kind of other 
forces at work. So the first one I want to turn to is kind of a risk aversion, risk premium theory. So tell us how uncertainty would work through that to affect the real economy. So it's, so it's a great question what, why uncertainty matters. Uh, in order for uncertainty to matter in models of behavior, what we need is curvature. So when things are linear, you have what's called certainty equivalence. You don't mind whether you're uncertain or not. And as soon as you have curvature, uncertainty begins to play a role. And there are two places economists typically include curvature when they think about the economy. One is on the household side, um, which is consumers have concave utility. Each dollar they get, they value less than the last one. And therefore, you know, they like security, they hate risk. Uh, this is, you know, a very old concept in economics. It goes back at least to the Nobel Prize winner, James Tobin, who was at Yale. Keynes talked about it. The idea here is if risk goes up, if you're more uncertain, consumers will save more and consume less. And that will generate, you know, that drop in consumption, um, at least in an open economy, would generate a drop in output. You also have an uncertainty story tied to risk aversion um, through businesses as well, right? You, you mentioned if uncertainty goes up, risk premiums go up, firms want to hoard more cash, uh, less likely to invest in, 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 in capital spending. Is that another angle there? That is. So that's a more finesse story. But that was actually looks like it was an important issue uh, around the Great Recession, which is imagine in our basic models, we don't think firms are risk averse. We think, you know, Firms are owned by, you know, the few shareholders and, you know, they, okay. they basically, they, but in practice, of course, firms are controlled in large part by the managers. This is a corporate governance issue and managers mm -hmm. of firms certainly don't want to load up on masses of risk. And the last thing they want to do is discover the firm's bankrupt. So there's plenty of evidence. And I have a, a paper with Zaji Lin and Ivan Alfaro looking at this called the finance uncertainty multiplier, that when uncertainty goes up, firms hoard cash. And again, this isn't a new finding. It's gone back for decades in the finance literature, but it seems to have taken on particular relevance now. If you're uncertain, I cut back on investment. I cut back on paying out dividends and I stash cash because I don't want to be left high and dry. So that's uh, uh, another way for how uncertainty can slow down the economy. It, it does increase risk premium, but it also leads firms, you know, holding risk premium right. constantly back to stash cash. So you've got m multiple negative effects of risk, consumers spend less, uh, the risk premium goes up, so firms invest less, and also they stash cash. The only, the only kind of thing to push back slightly is um, you've got to be careful in closed economies. This is, becomes more complicated because imagine consumers say, uh, consume less, they save more. Well, we know that in a closed economy, savings equals investment. So it's less clear how this affects growth in a big economy like the US. It's very clear that uh, risk is very damaging for small firm, for small economies. So that, um, there's a great paper um, by a group in the AER a few years ago that was showing that in small open economies, so South American countries, when risk goes up, the domestic economy tanks. And the story is basically the money flies out of the country. So they look at, for example, okay. Ecuador. And if you're in Ecuador, um, savings definitely doesn't equal investment. If, if <laughs> risk goes up, you can imagine... Right. You know, if I'm Ecuadorian, the last thing I want to do because there's an unstable government is save at home. So all the money flies out of the country and the country collapses. In the U.S., if risk goes up, actually, there's often what's called, you know, a flight to quality. So people save more, uh, but that savings can end up in investment. So that risk aversion channel is very powerful and negative in smaller open economies, in larger closed economies, which are more like the U.S. to the whole of Europe. Uh, it's less obvious, actually, whether it's negative. And I, I read that in your article. I was thinking about it. But one point you do make in the article, it it does become very prominent and severe when you hit the zero lower bound, right? Because at that at that point, you've got a rigidity that pr it's preventing that market from clearing. I mean, the story you're telling is you increase savings and interest rates should drop at, at some point to where the market clears. Um, but if you get stuck at the zero lower bound, if there's some kind of price rigidity, then all bets are off. That exactly right. So uh, another way you can have powerful effects uh, from big increases in uncertainty is with the, with the zero lower bound. And um, there's a couple of papers on this. And geez, I'm blanking on the exact co-author's names, but they show precisely that when uncertainty goes up, you'd like interest rates to drop so that savings equals investment. They're jammed at zero. That doesn't happen. And you get a nasty recession. Another way is actually prices don't adjust. 
So there's a paper by Basu and Bundik from the AER that argues um, when uncertainty goes up, you know, savers, uh, consumers want to consume less and save more and prices should drop. But if you have sticky prices, as you do in these new Keynesian models, again, markets don't clear and you can get drops in output. So uncertainty to risk aversion can be a powerful negative demand shock, but you need to go beyond the kind of classic um, linear re- business cycle model and include some of the rigidities we see in more recent models like the Keynesian models or the ZLB, yeah. and you can then get very powerful negative uh, drops down in output. You know, as I was reading this, I also was thinking along the lines of what John Cochran and Roger Farmer have recently advocated. So John Cochran, if you remember, he had a paper in the Journal of Finance when he was president where he kind of, I don't know if he introduced, but maybe he reintroduced this idea that discount rate theory of the business cycle, that everything is about the change in the discount rate. And, you know, the, you look at the present value of, of future resources and you're, you're discounting it. And his story is, you know, business cycles are driven by sudden changes in discount rates. But as I look at that, it's not all that different than uncertainty shocks, um, in my mind, anyhow, that there's some, there's some connection there. I also, we've had him on the show. We also had Roger Farmer on the show and he's, you know, he's a, a Keynesian, but he, he is very rigorous with his, his work, he has what's called a belief function in his model, where he's trying to you know, more carefully capture this idea of animal spirits. But both of these, they seem related, and they seem related to your idea of uncertainty, right? If there's a sudden uncertainty shock, it's going to affect the discount rate, it's going to affect animal spirits. So I think there's some overlap. Am, am I reaching here, or do you agree? No. <laughs> I de- you know, I very much agree. Um, interestingly enough, there's a uh, long been a discussion in the literature over the price of risk and the quantity of risk. So, in fact, I was discussing it with one of my graduate students here. But um, the, the, I always focus on the quantity of risk, the amount of uncertainty going up in recessions. Okay. And I think it's you know almost certainly the case that happens. In fact, I I, I missed earlier discussing. There's also lots of micro evidence. So you look at sure. firm ver- volatility and individual volatility. The other story is the price of risk, which is the risk premium goes up in recessions. And there's also lots of evidence for that. And that's more the John Cochran line. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure, I mean, we've seen the data both happen. There's both more risk and it's more expensive. As relating to animal spirits and Roger Farmer's work, I, I like his work very much. And yes, I would see this as a way um, to meld these together. For example, Martin Schneider uh, in the economics department here at Stanford has work on ambiguity aversion. So people don't like risk. And they're pessimistic. And of course, if risk goes up, they become much more pessimistic. And so the kind of intersection of this work with behavioral uh, generates, some, again, some pretty powerful effects. If you dislike risk, if you're pessimistic, uh, if you have kind of animal spirit beliefs, you can easily find that m- uh, upticks and uncertainty generate pretty strong negative effects on investment demand on consumption and therefore drops in output. Okay, well, let's move on to the other transmission mechanism, the other channel. So we just got done discussing the risk aversion, risk premia channel. You also mentioned the real option theory channel. So explain that to our listeners. How does uncertainty work through it? Yes, yeah, so uh, this is what I initially focused on in my PhD. Um, I had a model which is, it goes back, it's a, I'll come back to this later because I hadn't entirely read the literature. It generated a bit of a heart attack from it at some point in my, uh, in my job market. But there is a literature, Dixit Pindike, the best known uh, for this literature, showing the real options effect of uncertainty. So the idea here is if it's expensive to buy a piece of equipment and then sell it, or it's expensive to hire a worker, train them up, and then fire them, when you're uncertain, you tend to pause. So but on the consumer side, you can think of an equivalent version of your uncertain as to whether you're going to keep your job. The last thing you do is go out and buy a new car or buy a new refrigerator. And this is called the real option because you think of before you've gone out and bought a firm has gone out and bought a new piece of equipment or hired a new worker. It has the option to take that hiring or investment decision. Once it's done, it, it loses that option. And as you know from finance, options are more valuable when uncertainty is higher. Therefore, when uncertainty is high, it's more valuable to wait. And therefore, if you know, lots of firms wait, you get a drop in activity. So the real options model is very simple. It says when, when uncertainty goes up, firms are more cautious. They pause hiring. They pause investment. Consumers are more cautious. They, they pause particularly spending on consumer durables. And that causes a recession. Yeah. And in a minute, we're going to talk about the productivity slowdown. But I just have to ask right here and now. When I read that, 
part of your paper, I instantly thought of the productivity slowdown, right? If firms aren't doing as much capital spending, investment spending is declining, that has to uh, you know, play at some degree into a potential productivity slowdown. Yes and no. So I, okay. before, I go any, go any, go, before I go any further, I should I, you know, give few, full attribution to uh, the person, actually, when I did. I, I came out to give a job talk at Stanford, mm-hmm. and uh, I was talking to Bob Hall. Uh, and Bob Hall, I was explaining my job market paper, and Bob Hall said, um, hey, but uh, we've heard this all before. That was, uh, that was a paper by Ben Bernanke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at that point, I panicked, and Bob says, but right. go on, go on. And, you know, obviously I got the job, but, but as soon as I left Bob's office, I basically, you know, as soon as I had a break, I ran and downloaded that's Ben not Bernanke. What, that's not what you want to hear in a job talk presentation. No, it, it, it's terrifying. It's, you know, it's been done all before. It's the worst. But it turned out it was right. It was totally right. And in fact, the way it was very nice for me. So Ben Bernanke, his PhD, the key paper out of his PhD, and I believe his job market paper was uh, on exactly this. He published it in 1983 in the QJE. And it talks about, how an increase in uncertainty can lead to a temporary drop in output and then a rebound. And he had a very nice stylized model in the sense I was doing this quantitatively and bringing data to it. So then to come to your question, both my paper and Ben Bernanke's paper show the same stylized fact, which is a rise in uncertainty generates a a pause in activity. But when uncertainty drops back down again, activity resumes. So you can kind of think of it like a stream you dam the stream, and sure, you stop the stream, but all the water's building up behind the dam, and once you remove the dam, it all okay. floods back down. So in terms of linking up to the productivity slowdown, in my paper and other work like this, you know, Bernanke and m- much other work, you can have a temporary, quite negative effect of uncertainty and productivity. In order to have a long effect, it needs to be uncertainty is high and actually probably is rising over time. So um, my own view is, it probably had quite damaging effects in 2008, 2009, 2010. You know, it would have quashed a lot of R&D projects and investment by firms. But I don't think it can play a role in driving, you know, the secular decade by okay. decade slowdown in productivity. Well, let's move on into empirical estimates uh, of the importance of this issue. So you've mentioned some studies that have, have gone out. And I'm going to recall one from your Journal of Economic Pers- uh, Perspective paper And this was published in 2014, so maybe things have changed. But you mentioned you estimated roughly like a 9% GDP loss. That was both like a 3% actual decline in real GDP and then kind of GDP not growing uh, on its trend path. And if I'm correct, you attributed about 3% of that 9% loss in GDP to uncertainty. Is that right? Yeah, those are the yes, those are the numbers in the paper. Um, they have pretty big standard errors around them. Okay. The uncertainty, the uncertainty drop, I think, was you know the things it, on the right on the good and the bad side of that number. Obviously, on the bad side, it comes with pretty big standard errors. I got that all, both from a VAR and uh, using a model. As we know, <laughs> with everything in macro, you know, everything's endogenous. So everything's right. driven by everything else. So much as you know, Kidden and Prescott's first moment shocks are endogenous, so are my uncertainty shops, so is a ZLB, so is everything. Policies forward-looking, you know, it's it's a nightmare to fi- attri- attribute this. So they should be taken with a lot of, uh, you know, big standard error around them. But those were the, the best number, the best number I could come up with from triangulating both from data and model. The other thing to point out is that's a temporary phenomenon. So uncertainty, okay. going back to the early analogy, generated a sharp drop, but then once uncertainty subsides, uh, that goes and you get a, you know, a quick kick to the rebound. So uncertainty tends to be very damaging in the uh, kind of year of the recession. But I think the fall off in uncertainty is one of the reasons typically, as Milton Friedman described them, you know, recessions have these V shapes. We call it the guitar string theory. As you, you know, the harder you pull it down, the faster it snaps back. Um, and that's partly because uncertainty generates big drops, but also stores up, you know, the uh, rebound. Well, let's maybe step back and ask maybe a far more fundamental question about uncertainty. And you, you brought it up earlier, this question of endogeneity. So probably many people would say, yes, we believe in uncertainty, but you know, uncertainty is just a byproduct of bad policy, a financial crash, something else. But my takeaway from reading your articles is that it becomes a force of its own, that kind of, it, it kind of maybe it starts out because of something else, but it, it can grow into its own damaging uh, force that needs to be taken seriously. So do you see it that way? It, it maybe it, it Starts out endogenously, but becomes kind of an exogenous, independent force of its own. 
Yes, yeah, so I see two roles. One is as a impulse. So if you look back um, of recessions going back over the last 30 years, they're normally driven by some nasty event. So, you know, a war, an oil price shock, uh, in the case of 2008, 2009, the housing market collapse, and, or, you know, 2001 was 9-11 in large part. So these events turn out typically to, to be bad news. They also, which is a negative first moment shock, they also increase uncertainty. So, you know, 08, 09, Lehman's collapse, the housing market goes into meltdown. It's clearly bad news, but there's also dramatically more uncertainty. And that's the sense in which I actually think the shocks that hit the U.S. economy are multiple moments. They're not some kind of, you know, laboratory clean cut PFP shocks. Sure. They comprise several elements. One of them is uncertainty. Um, then the second element is, I, right, as you got to, I think there's also an amplification and propagation mechanism, which is the response of policymakers often to make things worse. So John Taylor's argued a lot in this case, you know, Lubos and Pasta, Pietro Lubos and, uh, and um, Lubos Pasta and Pietro Veronese, sorry, at Chicago have papers arguing that you, when times get bad, policymakers thrash around. And that creates more uncertainty. And you can see it in the radical uh, political outcomes you've had both in the U.S. and much of Europe that, you know, recessions have generated more polarizing and, you know, more uncertain politics, which I think has increased uh, problem, you know, slow down growth further. All right, Nick, what about uh, your AER paper where you discuss um, uncertainty, not just in a kind of a shock sense, but you look at the trend and you, and you have a paper that looks at the growing trend of policy uncertainty since the 1960s. Can you summarize that for us? What's going on? Yes, so I have a, uh, I should be clear, uh, an A uh, papers and proceedings paper. So it's a short summary paper. Okay. And it's with two, uh, Scott Baker, Steve Davis, and two political scientists, Jonathan Rodden and Canis Bre- Brennan's Ron in Princeton. And we look at policy uncertainty. We measure policy uncertainty going right back to the beginning of the last century. And we see this U-shape. So policy uncertainty was high around 1900s, you know, as bad up until the Great Depression, seemed to stabilize and fall after World War II, and then has been rising ever since. And this maps very closely, actually, to the U-shape in political polarization. So there's plenty of evidence showing that uh, politics was much more consensual after World War II. Democrats and Republicans weren't so far apart. But as you've seen, particularly recently, they're completely non-overlapping. And that appears to be one of the factors behind rising policy uncertainty. So the Democrats get in, they swing one way, the Republicans get in, they swing the other. And of course, for businesses, it makes it very hard to predict what's going on. And now is a great example. I mean, Trump has a pretty radical agenda. It's not clear what of it's what's going to be passed and what isn't. Uh, Congress is Republican, but you know, it is marginal. And there are certainly a number of Republicans that don't agree with Trump. I mean, go to Europe, the same thing in uh, Europe, for example, in my homeland, Brexit. I mean, right. You know, if there's ever been an uncertainty bomb, uh, <laughs> that's Brexit. And it's still unknown. I mean, nobody has any idea what's happening at Brexit. The politicians, you know, it's like uh, some kind of gunfight fast. They're all shooting each other and falling apart. Um, so that, you know, that's very much a sense in which uh, politics become more polarized. And I think that's one for over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, in the U.S., actually going back to World War II, and that seems to increase political uncertainty. Well, I guess there's something reassuring from that. We've been here before. <laughs> uh, maybe there's hope that we can uh, see a decline at some point in the future in political polarization. Hopefully it won't require a war, but uh, something might hopefully bring us back down. <laughs> well, let's move on to another area you've done a lot of research in. Uh, you You look at productivity, innovation, management issues. So, so why don't you share with us some of your findings, in particular to the, you know, the big question that's at hand right now. It's very topical, and that is, why has productivity growth slowed down so much? Yes, yeah, so I have a paper um, with Chad Jones, Mike Webb, and John Van Rienen called, you know, Our Ideas Getting Harder to Find. And this, for me, is kind of a bit of a, an intellectual journey in that I've changed my views about 180 degrees over the last five years. So this paper argues there is a productivity slowdown. It's a very Bob Gordon-esque position. It basically argues by looking at the data going back uh, to the 1930s, particularly to World War II, that what we're seeing in the US is A, uh, productivity growth has been slowing down. It's not that surprising, but you know it's not news to many people. But 
it's actually particularly convincing if you look back over many decades. Because productivity growth was about 3% post-World War II. It fell to kind of a couple of percent in the 80s, 90s. It's now down to about 1%. So it's fallen to a third of its long run, you know, a third of its post-war value. At the same time, R&D expenditure has been doubling roughly every two decades. So, you know, there's a frightening trend in this, which is we're spending ever more money on research and development, but actually creating, uh, you know, fewer and fewer ideas, certainly as measured by uh, the growth rate of GDP. Well, that's very sobering. So it's getting more expensive it, to produce new ideas, new innovations. That is. And, you know, I, I live on Stanford campus. I uh, right. spend a lot of time talking to scientists and engineers. My dad is actually a scientist and has, you know, is on his second biotech startup. You know, none of them are remotely surprised by this. So the story of it is uh, you can think of, you know, there's kind of two eras of history uh, or maybe three. So, you know, the first era of history is fascinating long and it goes from, you know, uh, uh, the Romans almost to uh, 1700 AD, where we had almost no growth. So the estimates of growth is like 0.1% a year, just pitiful, basically zero. And then we have the Industrial Revolution, which, which is a huge epoch changing event. But actually, growth only jumps up to 1%, which now would seem you know, horribly low, but back then was a you know, tenfold acceleration. And growth actually from 1800, when the Industrial Revolution started off in the UK, has been roughly increasing up to about two, you know, 3% around World War II. And that's an era of what I would call standing on the shoulders. So that goes back to Newton's quote, which is, if I've seen further than you, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. The idea that uh, you can build off other people's ideas and research to be more productive. And if you think of someone like Newton, he lived in an era where he had to work by candlelight. There was no electricity. There was no penicillin. There was no heating. There was no cars. You know, it was, he had a, a short day to work and it was freezing. He got sick. He died young. Um, but from the 1800s to the, you know, about World War II onwards, there is more and more in, inventions coming on and it's made future inventors more productive. And so he saw an acceleration in productivity growth. Around uh, World War II, the second per- era seemed to, or I guess the third epoch seemed to, seemed to set in, which is the apple tree model, whereby ideas are getting harder and harder to come by. And here the view is, by World War II, we had you know, a large number of elite research active universities. We had many industrial labs, and they're just pouring huge, you know, billions of dollars into research and development. <laughs> and it's actually stomach started to become more and more crowded. And it's becoming harder and harder to find new ideas. And we're very much in that era now. Now, that doesn't mean it can't change. It doesn't mean 20 years from now, suddenly we make a revolutionary breakthrough and productivity growth accelerate. But I think it's a reasonably safe bet looking at recent history to say productivity growth is going to remain reasonably poor, as in one, maybe of a lucky 2% a year for the next 10 or 20 years. Nick, that's not very inspiring. <laughs> not very hopeful. <laughs> I, you, you, you know, David, you have to renorm your expectations. So you know, the one the one pushback I want to say is, yeah. uh, you know, our, our expectations in some ways have just got out of line. We're used to expecting three, four percent growth because that's what our near history has. But if you took right. an average over the last hundred thousand, ten thousand years, you'd be ecstatic uh, with you know one to two percent growth. So we are actually heading back towards the growth rates we're experiencing around the Industrial Revolution, A. And point B is it's not even clear. I mean, this could change 20 years from now. I, you know, In Stanford, I see all kinds of amazing uh, inventions, things like the driverless car, nanotechnology, mm-hmm. you know, genetic engineering. Some of these things could have revolutionary breakthroughs. You know, the, the, the saying is people are over-optimistic about change in the next five years and under-optimistic in the next 20 years. I just... You know, think rather than looking at science fiction, we should look at history. And recent history in particular is is not very uh, optimistic uh, on growth rates for the next 20 years. You know, but if you want to look at it optimistically, just compare it to, you know, the more distant past. And, and on those grounds, it doesn't look so bad. Well, a couple of points on that I'd like you to respond to. First, I wonder if the declining rate of innovation or the more expensive cost of innovation can be a product of our increasingly risk-averse society. So I've had Tyler Cowan on the show, and I kind of latched on to this idea that we, his argument in his book, The Complacent Classes, as we've become more wealthy, more, more fluent, we're more risk-averse in all areas of our lives. We're comfortable with what we have. And so from everything from how we raise our kids to you know, who we let into our neighborhood – 
to regulations protecting labor. I mean, one example he gives, and I've used repeatedly on the podcast, is it would be very difficult for us to build the Hoover Dam again because of all the regulations and laws. Uh, we're not as dynamic. And there's a lot of other research going on that, that speaks to this as well. But I guess I wonder if is the increasing cost of innovation a, a byproduct of our increasingly risk-averse culture that's manifested in th- these many different ways? It's a very interesting question. So, um, you know, living out in Silicon Valley, uh, you often get the pushback of the, you know, no, we're not more risk averse. Look at the huge flood of venture capital, which is, you know, risk loving investment is pouring out. That's a good On the question. other hand, you, you do hear lots of stories. So one good anecdote in favor of Tyler Cowen, and I listened to that podcast because your podcast with Tyler is um, think of the way that pharmaceutical innovation has moved from big pharma to biotech. So my father talk, you know, talks a lot about this, that 20, 30 years ago, you used to have uh, a lot of research done at big pharmaceutical firms. They were pouring out amazing inventions with massive R&D programs. But what's happened is they've to some extent stultified by the fact they have huge labs. There's a bit of a nine to five safety culture. He says if you visit these pharma firms, the lights are not on on the weekends. There's hardly anyone in them. Whereas instead, if you go to biotech firms, these small startups that are spun out of universities, there you'll see people working 100-hour weeks, taking huge risks, really sweating it out because they own the equity. And in fact, the whole business model of pharmaceuticals has moved from big pharma firms doing R&D in-house to now just having a war chest of cash they use to spend on you know, successful biotech startups. And therefore, effectively, they're paying indirectly for the research going on in biotechs. And that's one way to get around you know, the regulatory death and the safety death that's happening in pharmaceutical firms. Yeah, okay. My other point um, is one that Alex Tabaruk has raised. Uh, he had a TED Talk, man, it's probably three, four years ago now, but he talked about the potential for global growth coming from China and India. We, we've already seen some of that, but his argument is as more and more Chinese become part of the middle class as their income levels go up, and same thing in India at some point, they're going to really want... Their demand for things that we take for granted today will soar. So there'll, there'll be a huge increased demand for cures for cancer, for AIDS, um, maybe driverless cars, who knows. But his argument is once you get this huge market over there and you get people who are no longer um, you know, subsistent living, they're actually a part of the middle class, you're going to have ideas. You know, The more and more p- people you have, the greater the likelihood you're going to have an Einstein you know, among that crowd. So are you hopeful that innovation maybe or, or research, other parts of the world might emerge um, and make up for the decline, the costliness in the U.S.? Yes, and I think that's already been incredibly helpful. So there are two trends going on. One is ideas are getting harder to find. And in fact, Moore's Law is a great example of this. Moore's Law, which is the number of silicon chips, uh, the number of transitions on a silicon chip to double roughly every other year. That's actually st- held pretty constant since Gordon Moore made that prediction in the 60s. But the, the amount of scientists involved in that R&D has gone up 25 fold. So wow. it's becoming harder and harder for scientists to make this innovation. But then you think, hey, hang on a minute, but you know, Moore's law has kept constant <laughs> as in we're still making those breakthroughs. Why is that? And the reason is the market's got ever bigger. So if I'm Intel, um, now I know that if I come up with a next generation chip, I'm not only selling to wealthy people in America, I'm selling to most Americans, Europeans, and a large, massive market in Asia, some of South America, some of Africa. So thankfully, grow, you know, there's two forces moving in opposite directions. One is each innovation is getting harder to make. The opposite one is that for a given innovation, you can now sell to an ever-growing market. And those two are roughly offsetting each other. The first seems to be slightly dominant, and that's why growth is slowly slowing down. But, you know, it'd be slowing down a lot faster if it weren't for the, the growth of the rest of the world. So, yes, absolutely. That's helping. Uh, you know, that's preventing a cataclysmic drop in growth. It's making meaning instead we're having a gradual trend down. Yeah. But I, I take your point and, <clears throat> and Robert Gordon type points that we are still in a world that's very similar to one 30, 40 years ago. We've had a lot of innovations, but we still drive cars. We still live in homes. Um, transportation is still relatively the same. You know, what would a radically changed world look like? Maybe hyperloops, you know, maybe cheaper transportation across the globe in an instant. Um, so we, we are a long ways from maybe this next stage, whatever it might be. 
So it's, I think it's a fair critique that you, you raise along with, with Robert Gordon. I just want to remain optimistic here and be hopeful. Uh, and <laughs> I, you, I, you know, I, I don't want to say we're pessimists. You know, I, I gave a very high profile talk out here three years ago claiming productivity growth is not slowing down. Uh, it's on the inter, you know, it's on the web. It's embarrassing, yeah. but it's there in a sense. <laughs> and changed my mind just by looking at the data. I mean, I'm a data mm-hmm. guy, and you know, the data shows a slowdown. On the other hand, you know, two percent growth isn't bad. The reason, by the way, I think there's such angst over slowing growth is that we actually not only have slowing growth, but far worse, we have rising inequality. Okay. Slowing growth, if inequality wasn't rising, would not be such a problem. I mean, nobody really minds that much three percent versus two percent. The reason uh, it's been so horrible and we've seen the rise in protest politics and I think breaking apart society is inequality has gone up at the same time. And actually, I think that's the much bigger evil than uh, slowing growth rate. Okay. One last question. So you've written on management practices as they relate to productivity. So share with us your findings and your research on that topic. Sure. So I, long ago, I worked at McKinsey, uh, the management consultant in London. And I, you know, I saw management being a uh, hugely variable and very important. And I kind of got frustrated that when I came back to e- academia, the economists poo pooed the whole idea of management. You know, I used to joke that I'd give a seminar and uh, I, I, people would hear my English accent and they'd, you know, give me a 20 IQ point bump up <laughs> in their estimation. Yep. But then they'd see the M word, the management word in the title and, you know, deduct 25 points. And I'd next <laughs> hour and nice. a half or two myths would. So I, I and you know I should also say man it's not like it's a modern topic. Francis Walker, who was the founder of the American Economics Association, ran the 1870-1880 census, and in fact was the second president of MIT, hence the Walker Memorial. Um, he had his fir- a paper in the first volume of the Quarterly Journal of Economics, our oldest economics journal, arguing that management drives differences in business performance. It somehow kind of got forgotten about in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and I came back to it with a number of other people, John Van Rien and Raphael Sadun in particular, just measuring management practices across firms using surveys and census measures and showing it's highly correlated with firm performance. So, you know, it's not rocket science. It's kind of painful, tedious data work. But they, we just see in the data massive variations in management practices, and they're strongly related to performance. And coming back to your earlier points, better managed firms tend to be in competitive free markets without much regulation when they're, you know, run by professionals and terrible firms are in, you know, government or family owned with heavily regulated areas with no competition. Very interesting. Well, that leaves us with a glimmer of hope that we can get better management and higher productivity growth. Our guest today has been Nicholas Bloom. Nick, thank you so much for joining the show. Great. Thank you very much. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.